Welcome to Markets Now. Ted Seifert, Zanarak Hedge is joining us. And we had a mostly higher day in the grains with the exception of soybeans over in the livestock cattle up, hogs ended lower. So Ted, let's start off over in the wheat market where we've seen most of the excitement here. Six days up in SRW wheat. China business has been pushing it. How much farther do you think we're going to be able to go here? Um, is this the catalyst finally with China um, buying that will finally get these shorts to blow out? Yeah. So that's a really great question, Michelle. Uh, we're With today's high, we're running up in the key resistance level. So this is either going to be where we fail or the fund short covering could snowball after this. And the, the, the catalyst for that might be, is there more business to be done with China? And if there is, then yes, I do think there, there can be a, a pretty aggressive short covering uh, correction here. I, I don't know if I want to say that the lows are ultimately in in wheat, but they could be in for a little while. And the last time we had this reversal higher like we did, it was actually a key reversal in March, Kansas City wheat. Uh, last time we did something like that was back in, in March. It ended up being a, a three month roughly rally uh, that was good for about $1.80. Now, again, ultimately we made new contract lows after that, uh, but we could be setting up for something like that. You know, just something to get the funds to cover their shorts because to this point, we have not given them a reason from a technical standpoint, from a chart standpoint uh, to do so, but we're on the verge of doing that in a bigger way, Michelle. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, and again, that kind of spills over into corn a little bit as well. Yeah, so talk about corn because we've been hearing talk that China's gonna come in and buy US corn as well. And does that help us put this harvest low finally in that market, do you think? Yeah, finally. You know, uh, a lot of analysts have been calling for this harvest low or post-harvest low for a couple months now. Uh, but but it seems to be a little bit more legitimate now at this point. I am wondering if maybe the low is in now for corn, uh, partially because we are really the cheapest corn in the world at the moment. Uh, the Argentinian farmers aren't selling right now because they're waiting for the new president to come in because he's promised to cut our uh, agricultural taxes. So they're they're figuring if they wait a little bit longer, they'll get more money. So so that's uh, uh, that's helping us. Uh, and then also Brazil, they're slow on selling their corn because they're not sure about that replacement crop yet. Um, so if China does come back in or does need to buy corn, it could very likely be from us. And there could be uh, a pretty decent amount of corn sold to China. If that's the case, that means that fundamentals uh, for corn are maybe a little bit brighter than they were a couple of weeks ago. Now, I'm not going to say that they are game changer you know china's china purchasing corn wouldn't be a game changer you know we do have above a two billion bushel carryover scheduled right now for corn we could really use some extra demand to get that closer to or below a two billion bushel carryover so it's not um wildly bullish but it would be really nice to see and maybe that does allow us to embrace the seasonal trend to kind of drift higher into the end of the calendar year all right but I'll play as devil's advocate because once we get, you know, close to those resistance levels here, then you start seeing farmer selling pick up. Yeah. So, but that's one of the reasons why we do see this seasonal tendency to drift higher into the calendar, into the end of the calendar years, because guys have sold what they wanted to sell. Now they, they, they like to sort of lock the bins, don't want to add on to their taxes for, for this year. Uh, they'll wait till after the first of the year. And whether that's the case or not, I mean, I, I don't know. That That's a case-by-case -case basis. I think this year could be a little bit different than that because of the interest rates that we're paying. Uh, guys might want to, to, to free up some cash in order to kind of uh, take care of those loans so they're not paying these higher interest rates. Um, so I don't know. It's a really good question. I, I think you playing devil's advocate is a good thing because I've been doing that mostly for the past couple of months. Uh, and as I said, I'm not wildly bullish corn, but maybe just maybe uh, we've, we've put enough pressure on it to the downside that we can at least trade sideways to slightly higher between now and the end of the year. Yeah. And soybeans, we're back under these key moving averages. So is the market just taking Brazilian weather premium out looking ahead at that forecast or what? Yeah, but, you know, as there usually is in a weather market, uh, Michelle, a big argument uh, over the longer term weather, uh, you know, some some of the models have it, uh, you know, kind of returning back hot and dry again. Sort of like what we saw during our growing season where this weather market was on again, off again, on again, off again. Um, other forecast models have this as a major weather pattern change that really fixes the problems in Brazil. Doesn't bring them back to, you know, the potential that they originally had. Uh, but at least it uh, keeps whatever potential is left there. 
which is, I, I would say, still pretty decent, uh, still potential for a bigger crop than what they had last year. So uh, we'll continue to trade a weather market. But as you said, you know, soybeans at the end of the day, Monday ended up closing below trend line, closing below major moving averages in the 50 and the 200 day moving averages. Uh, not a great look on a chart. We did bounce off of the low there Tuesday, uh, sort of reversal back to unchanged, maybe suggesting that the pressure might be done for the moment, at least until we get a better idea of what those forecasts look like going forward. Yeah. And do you think we'll get a better sense of crop size in Brazil or Argentina as we get into the WASD here on Friday? Right. So that's like the one thing that we're going to have to look at on the WASD on Friday uh, the USDA doesn't change production on this report, so we won't be looking at yield or, or harvested acreage or any of that. Um, they can change domestic demand, but generally speaking, they wait to the January report because that's when we, we can see some, some bigger changes on the production side of things. And then, you know, then they'll, they'll do something on demand. So likely there won't be a whole lot of changes on the domestic balance sheet for corn, soybeans, or wheat. Um, but the South American crop and a lot of years, if there's issues with Argentina, it's too early to see any changes show up on a WASDE report. But for Brazil and for their first season crop and soybeans in particular, there can be some changes on this report. So we will be looking very closely. I think the average trade guess is looking for just over a 160. I think it's like 160.2 uh, million metric ton crop from Brazil. That's down from a 163, which is what we saw on the last WASDE report. So we are looking for a reduction. Um, a medium sized one at that. Uh, but if it if, if the USDA comes in and slashes it, say, 6 million metric tons, well, that'll get our attention. I know, but that seems a little aggressive for USDA. They like to slow step this, don't they? You know, it's interesting, Michelle. I, I feel like in the last few years or so, they've been a little bit more ripped the Band-Aid off than they have been the stair step in and stair step out that we had been used to for so many years of, of the historically <laughs> – slow and moving USDA. I, I do think they are a little bit more nimble on their feet nowadays. Uh, okay. And when they do something like that, it, I, I think kind of signals that, oh, wow, there maybe is a problem. Uh, I think the market would get fairly excited. Now, I'm not suggesting that's what they're going to do. Uh, I'm just saying that could be the, the bullish surprise on a report if that were to happen. And let's talk about cattle, a little short covering bounce today, but after a $30 break in live cattle from the September highs, and I think a $60 break in feeders is probably justified, but will this hold or will it be sold? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, and this is sort of the third level of consolidation that we've had, which that's usually what I look for for a near-term bottom uh, in markets like this, where we are really just kind of in a free fall, like a, in feeder cattle in particular, uh, we had gotten very oversold. We're due for a bit of a bounce. In fact, I think we've really overshot the mark when it comes to what I would call fair value. That has a tendency to happen in markets, especially thinly trade markets, traded markets that have big open interest when it comes from your speculative, your large speculators, your funds. Um, so, yeah, I think fundamentally we can we could probably justify a low being in place now at this point. Um, but I don't know. We'll have to see. I do like the higher trade that we had on Tuesday after the lower trade that we had on Monday. Uh, last week, we, we started with some higher trade and then gave it back at the end of the oh, week. Yeah. All this volatility might be suggesting that we are in, a, in an extreme for the time being. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we have a low in for feeders. For live cattle, yeah, cash has continued to come down. Box beef prices have come down. Um, but we do have a, a production shortfall going into the end of the first quarter of next year. I do think we may have overshot the mark there too. And I'm, I'm optimistic that there's some upside potential. Are the funds flat now, Ted, in the live cattle and feeders or not? <laughs> well, again, we don't have up to the moment uh, uh, yeah, on that, but uh, I have them short about 30,000 contracts in live okay. cattle currently. So there is still some room for them to continue to liquidate, but I'm not sure they want to. I, I think that there is just this sort of core position in live cattle that the funds have been using for an inflationary hedge. Yeah, they don't have as much of a reason to have that on as, as they did, say, this time last year or certainly the year before. Uh, but I, I just I wonder if they really do want to go flat or even go short uh, in live cattle. I, I kind of wonder if maybe this is this has been enough for them for now. Let's hope so. And we had hogs going the opposite direction today. I felt like those cattle hog spreads were being put back on. But the hog market... Um, we've got a few issues there. I mean, we can't get cash to catch and we still continue to hear 
stories out of China that they're liquidating their herd. So how much of a problem is that for us? Yeah, so pork values in China were down sharply overnight leading into the day there on Tuesday. And yeah, obviously that spilled over to us as well. Um, that also kind of spills over to soy soybeans too, because their crush margins have been under a lot of pressure. And when you put that together with lower pork prices, you know, bad soybean crush margins, lower pork prices, What's that telling us, Michelle? You know, China's not always very forthcoming with, you know, information specifically when it pertains to, you know, disease issues. Um, a lot of times we'll hear after the fact when they act, when they absolutely have to tell us, I guess. Uh, and you wonder what this liquidation is all about. You're also seeing a bit of a slump in their domestic demand for pork, which, again, that's the sort of thing that happens when you're dealing with disease issues and people are worried about it. I don't know. You know, it, it's just not a good feel coming out of China right now with these lower pork prices that we're, we're continuing to see. Um, and it means that there's a lot of product coming to market in the short period of time, short to mid period of time. Longer term, it might actually be fairly bullish from us because, it, you know, if they are going to have to call a, a fair amount of their, their hog herd, well, we will have to replace some of that production later on. But we might be a long ways off from that, Michelle. So, We'll continue to watch that Chinese market if that continues to be under pressure. Again, short-term bearish, long-term, maybe friendly. That is Ted Seifert, Zener Egg Hedge, and that's Markets Now.